Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We'll learn how to do this eventually. <laughs> Please take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Acts. Tonight we're in Acts chapter 18, the title of the message, Mighty in the Scriptures. Mighty in the Scriptures. We're in Acts chapter 18. Tonight we'll be looking at verses 24 through 28. We'll begin reading in verse 18. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Sancria, for he had a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you, if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures came to Ephesus. This man instructed was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom, when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them, and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you that the scriptures all point to Jesus and that we can show by the scriptures, the scriptures of the Old Testament, that Jesus is indeed the Christ. It is Christ in all the scriptures as he himself expounded to the two on the road to Emmaus. Jesus is the Messiah, not merely the Messiah of Israel, but the one who is the savior of the world. Father, we pray that you will make us men and women who are mighty in the scriptures. That we might know of Christ in all the scriptures. That when someone comes up to us and does not understand, that you might direct us to the precise scriptures that are needed to point them to Christ. Gracious Father, how we thank you for that. That Jesus Christ has the preeminence, for he is the living word of God, even as we study the written word of God. And so we pray for your blessings upon this message tonight, that he would be glorified, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. The road to Emmaus. There Jesus appeared to the two as they were on their way, sorrowing, thinking that it was all over, even though they had heard of the resurrection. And Jesus appeared to them, but their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he walked with them and talked with them and asked them why they were sad. And they said, are you only a stranger in Jerusalem? Don't you know what has happened? And he said, what? And they said, well, there was this man called Jesus of Nazareth. By the way, a very important phrase we'll be looking at tonight. And we had thought that he was the Messiah, but... He was crucified three days ago. And you know, this morning, some of the women in our company, they actually came back with tales from the tomb saying he's risen from the dead. But, you know, we, we know that kind of thing doesn't happen. <laughs> so we're on our way home. Jesus said, oh, you fools and slow of heart to believe all that the scriptures have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to have risen from the dead? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures 
the things concerning himself. About a year ago, we went through every book of the Old Testament and found the prophetic passages, at least many of them, we certainly couldn't cover them all, but many of the prophetic passages in every book of the Old Testament that dealt with the Lord Jesus. I hope you took notes then. I hope that if somebody says, can you show me Christ in the book of Amos, you'd know where to go. Can you show me Christ in the book of Hosea, that you'd know where to go. If somebody says, show me Christ in Zechariah, you'd take them to Zechariah 14, where it describes his second coming. Christ in all the scriptures. Here tonight we have a man named Apollos, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures. But he only knew the baptism of John. But he was mighty in the scriptures. The New Testament had not yet been written. So when it says he was mighty in the scriptures, it's talking about he was mighty in his knowledge, understanding, and application of the Old Testament. He knew there was a coming Messiah. He knew what the Old Testament described the Messiah would be like. He knew that John the Baptist had prophesied that he himself was not worthy to, to unleash the, the shoelaces of the, of the one who was coming after him. He knew that the baptism of John was a baptism unto repentance. But he didn't know that Jesus had come. You know, there were certain other disciples that the Apostle Paul found, and they thought that the Messiah was still coming. They didn't know that he had come and been here and then had gone back to heaven again. We're in a transition period as we go through the book of Acts. We see God opening the door to different groups of people as we move through the book of Acts until he has brought in the entire contingency of all the different types of people. We start with Jewish males in Acts chapter 2. We get to Acts chapter 8 and we find the Samaritans. And both men and women are mentioned in Acts chapter 8. They're half Jewish, they're half Gentile. We find that the Ethiopian eunuch at the end of Acts chapter 8 comes in. He's born a Gentile, but he's become a Jew, and he's neither male nor female. He's a eunuch. We get to chapter 10, and God brings in not merely Gentiles in Acts chapter 10 as he widens the door through the book of Acts to reach all different people groups, but he brings in people who are representative of the Romans, the people who are oppressing the Jews, and brings them into the body of Christ on the same basis and same level as every other one who has been brought in throughout the book of Acts. We see that going on here. Here's a man, a man who took what he had and used it to the full for the glory of Christ. He had certain gifts, he had certain abilities, but he didn't have enough knowledge. There are many people who have gifts and abilities, but they don't have the knowledge. There are some people who have no gifts and abilities, but they have the knowledge and they do nothing. Others who, without any kind of gifts or abilities, have the knowledge and they use it for the glory of Christ. And it's God's word that has the power, not our abilities. We'll see that tonight with Apollos, though he was a gifted man. It's the word of God that is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What you need to know is the scriptures. Here was a man who was eloquent, Wonderful gifts that God gave him. But where the emphasis is, he was mighty in the scriptures. Do you know the word of God? Can you take the Bible? Can you refute the gainsayers? The scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Do you know your word? Do you have it memorized? Do you meditate upon it? in the watches of the night? Do you study it diligently every morning, every evening? Throughout the day, do you think about it? Do Bible verses come to your mind when different difficult situations arise? Are you mighty in the scriptures? That's where it's at. Now, last week, we looked at verses 18 through 23. The message then was entitled, Paul Gets a Crew Cut. We see him cutting his hair off at Sancria. And we learned that Paul was not easily intimidated. Uh, even after the riot that took place in the immediate preceding verses, 
where they dragged him into court, he didn't leave town. It says he stayed there a good while after, verse 18. Paul, after this, after that riot, after he's brought before Gallio, the judge, <coughs> after all kinds of horrible things that were, had been going on, it says he stayed there yet a good while. He's not easily intimidated. The second thing we inferred last week that was Paul was fully aware of his marching orders from God. He was going to do the job and he was going to fulfill the work that God had called him to do. Are we doing that? Or are we easily sidetracked? Paul was never sidetracked. Paul was a bulldog. Paul went into the fight and he finished the fight. It was either Paul would be dead or Paul would finish the fight. Paul was like that. We talked about him like that before. He took with him, as you know from the text before, Priscilla and Aquila, a married couple with whom he'd been living in Corinth because they were all tent makers. And uh, apparently they were hosting the entire church in their home from what we read in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 9. The churches of Asia salute you, Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. We talked about you know, how difficult that would be for some of us in modern times with our teeny tiny little apartments to get an entire church of people. And at Corinth there were a lot of believers and Aquila and Priscilla hosted them every week. We saw that the name Priscilla literally means little old woman. This was probably an older couple. That was a term of endearment that was uh, given to her there. But even though they were older, they were willing to get up and go with Paul on a missionary journey. They left with Paul. When Paul left Corinth, they went with him. They were headed back to Jerusalem with Paul. And from our text tonight, we see that they stopped at many places along the way. But they were determined to serve Christ. Their age didn't make any difference. The fact that Priscilla was a woman didn't make any difference. Never use old age as an excuse to get out of serving Christ or using it as an excuse not to fully and actively participate in a mission vestment that opens up for you. And after the service last week, one of the ladies came up and told me about some folks who went on a, a mission trip in their 80s. Yeah, that sounds exciting, doesn't it? Over to Africa in their 80s. Then we saw in the training of Apollos, both Aquila and Priscilla are mentioned. She was obviously theologically astute. She knew her Bible well. She was involved in helping Apollos see that the Old Testament messianic prophecies were fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. So never use the excuse that you're a woman, so therefore you don't really have to study and know the Bible like the men have to do. Women should know the Bible just as well as the men. God has ordained men for leadership. But God has given us his word for every one of us, men and women alike. We spent most of our time last week, you recall, on the vow that Paul had taken. It was a Nazarite vow. Paul shaved his head because he had some kind of a Nazarite vow. And we talked about the many different kinds of vows that are in the Old Testament. Paul was a strictly observant Jew prior to accepting Christ as his Messiah. So the vow he had taken would have been one of the vows listed in the Old Testament. And the only one that requires you to shave your head, because it mentions it specifically in connection with the vow here, was the Nazarite vow. By the way, and that was a vow that was permitted both to men and women. It related to a person being set apart from other things for the specific service of God. We saw the two different types of Nazarite vows. One could be a vow for life that was given by parents when a child was born and the kid was stuck with it. <laughs> there are at least three Nazarites of that type that we mentioned in the Old Testament. Uh, we saw that Samson was one of those Nazarites and he obviously broke his vow. Samuel was one of those Nazarites. John the Baptist was one of those Nazarites. We saw that there are at least seven things that visibly showed that a person had taken a Nazarite vow in addition to him uh, having this unique hairstyle, if you will. The Nazarites had to abstain from wine, from grapes, from every production of the vine. They had to abstain from all intoxicating drink of any other kind. They were forbidden to approach any dead body, even that of a near relative. At the end of the vow, they were released from their restrictions, but to gain the release, they had to go to Jerusalem and offer a ewe lamb for a burnt offering, a second ewe lamb for a sin offering, a ram for a peace offering, and all the other types of sacrifices that accompany peace offerings, and there are a whole bunch of them. We've gone through the offerings before. He also had to offer a basket of unleavened bread, cakes of fine flour mingled with oil, wafers of unleavened bread anointed with oil. He had to offer a meal offering and a drink offering. He had to cut off his hair at the door of the tabernacle when the tabernacle was in the wilderness and put it into the fire under the sacrifice on the altar. The priest would then take part of the offering and present them as a wave offering unto the Lord. 
The Nazarite would then have to give a specific gift to the priest, depending on the seriousness of the reason for which the Nazarite had taken the vow. Rather complex. And as we get on and Paul gets to Jerusalem and begins to go through this process with four other men who have had a Nazarite vow, they're there for a whole week going through this process. It wasn't just, whew, I'm glad the vow is over and I can get rid of this uh, hairdo that's been you know, very hot and sweaty here in the Mediterranean. They had a humongous long list of things that they had to do to finish off their vow. But it was a purpose to show that the Nazarite had renounced the world with all its pleasures so that all those things that are so unfavorable to sanctification and to all the defiling influences of the world, he was set apart to God for a specific time and for a specific service. We saw that that's a picture and a type of what the New Testament believer is supposed to be like all the time. The New Testament believer is to have a perpetual lifestyle of holiness. Holiness from the moment of our new birth through our physical death, not merely the Old Testament ritual that foreshadowed our position in Christ. That's why the Old Testament Nazarite, for example, couldn't touch a dead body because of the impending symbolism of what would be true in the life of the New Testament believer. The Old Testament vows showed that the person was holy unto the Lord. But today, for every believer, we are to be holy unto the Lord all of the time. And we read all the way through Numbers chapter 6, verses 1 through 21, where the Nazarite vow is described for us. We pointed out that being a Nazarite is not the same thing as being a Nazarene. Being a Nazarene means that you came from the town of Nazareth. It has nothing to do with taking a Nazarite vow. Jesus was a Nazarene, but he was not a Nazarite. All the pictures that show Jesus with long hair are wrong. He was a Nazarene. That means he was from Nazareth. In fact, we'll see that that is emphasized in the New Testament. But he was not a Nazarene. No indication anywhere in the Bible that Jesus ever had long hair. Because Paul discusses the long hair issue on men in 1 Corinthians 11, where he says that it is a shame for a man to have long hair. Hence, being a Nazarite for any length of time clearly made that man stand out as strangely different from other men. It was a visible sign of the vow that he had taken. And we pointed out that last week that it was interesting that Paul shaved his head at Sancria, which is a suburb of Corinth, where that issue of long hair was a problem rather than waiting to go back to Jerusalem. He had some serious reasons for doing that. Apparently, the new converts at Corinth were trying to copy Paul as their model in everything, including the way that he had not cut his hair during the time that he had had this Nazarite vow. They were Gentiles. They were saved out of paganism. They would not have the foggiest clue concerning the meaning or the significance of the Nazarite vow. But that was for Jews, the Nazarite vow. That's why Paul did two things. Number one, he shaved his head because the vow had come to an end. And he shaved it in Corinth so that the entire church could see him with his shaved head, a buzz cut. And number two, to make sure nobody forgot, he wrote an extended section of 1 Corinthians 11 to explain the theological reasons why the Nazarite vow is not for the church and the biblical reasons that men should have short hair. We are all to live holy lives as unto the Lord. You don't have to set apart a period of time where you're, the men are all growing their hair really long and shaggy. No, we are all to be holy unto the Lord. And he made it clear that Christ didn't have long hair because he said, after he had shaved his head, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Those are the words that introduce the section about long hair on men. <clears throat> so we're not going to go through that again, but I think that's important for us to remember. Men having long hair was not always a sign of a man's godliness either. Having long hair could also be a sign of rebellion. We've talked about Absalom in 2 Samuel chapter 14, verses 25 through 26. And it's been obviously a sign of rebellion against authority ever since the 1960s hippie movement. Now we get down a little bit later. Here's Paul eager to get back to Jerusalem so he could finish the requirements of his vow. And we find him moving in that direction. But even on his way back to Jerusalem to fulfill his vow, Paul made the best possible use of ministry time to strengthen the church. And then it mentions, in verse 24, Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures. Now, I don't know if anything rings sort of dissonant with you as you read those first two phrases, but if you know anything about history and names, 
it should ring some clangy kind of noisy bells in your head. The first thing that we notice is the striking disharmony of that first phrase, a certain Jew named Apollos. A Jew named Apollos. The name Apollos means dedicated to Apollo. <laughs> a Jew named I'm dedicated to Apollo. Doesn't that strike you as sort of strange? How in the world did Jewish parents end up giving their little baby Jewish boy the name of a pagan Greek god? In fact, Apollo was the highest, second highest god in the Greek pantheon after Zeus. He was the son of Zeus. He was the lawgiver of the Greek states. He presided over religious law and expiation of offenses against the gods. When the people who worshipped the Greek gods felt that they had offended the Greek gods, they would bring sacrifices to the Greek gods. And you know which one of the Greek gods was in charge of the expiation of their sins? It was Apollo. He was the god of music before Pan. Apollo stood for the bright and shining sun. He was the Greek god that communicated to man through prophets and oracles the knowledge of the future and the will of Zeus. He was considered, I hope you're picking up some of these clues here, he was considered the shepherd god. He was considered the epitome of male beauty. In the Iliad, Homer portrays him as the deadliest of the gods and compares his coming with the swift onrushing of the night in book one of the Iliad. In every way, I hope you pick this up, in every way he appears to be a counterfeit of the second person of the Trinity. All those things there, the one who's the lawgiver, the one who presides over the religious law, the one who, who sends away our offenses, the one who is the god of all brilliant music, the one who is as the sun, he's the Greek god that communicates to man through prophets and oracles, the future, the will of God his father, he's a shepherd god. You know, all of those things. Satan is a counterfeiter, folks. Satan is a counterfeiter. All the praise and glory and attributes of the Lord Jesus Christ are counterfeited by Satan. He tries to take the glory away from God. Apollo, after whom this man, Jewish baby named Apollos, he was named after a god like that. But Apollos also had character qualities that are definitely not a copy of Christ. He was a lustful god that took advantage of many mortal girls. He was the primary god of the oracle at Delphi. Some archaeologists have offered evidence that his original roots were of Hittite origin before the Greeks. Of course, the Bible mentions the Hittites like Uriah the Hittite. We know from archaeology that they were a very vile and sensual people. Apollo, get this, was the god the personal God chosen for himself by Caesar Augustus. In fact, Caesar Augustus attributed his victory over Anthony and Cleopatra to Apollo. And yet here is a little Jewish baby boy being named Apollos. What do you think his parents were thinking when they named him that? I think that shows us that parents don't always give godly names to their children, even if they're believers. But folks, and you know that I feel very strong on this particular issue, names have meaning. And a Christian parent should always try to give names to their children that bring glory to God. If a name has a meaning that does not directly bring glory to God, a character trait of that name should be sought that does. Let me give you an illustration or example of that. Some of you have been to the Institute in Basic Life Principles, uh, what's been called the Bill Gothard Seminar. It used to be called the um, Institute in Basic Youth Conflicts. Um, and he gives an illustration where he was talking to some parents about names, and their little daughter, who was like a teenager, was apparently there. And uh, so he said, well, you know, uh, why don't you take this book and you can look up your name? Because there are books that have names and what those names mean. So she went out as, the, as Bill was talking to these, the parents, and a little while later, he came back, she came back in. And um, <clears throat> so the parents were eager and they said, well, did you find out what your name means? She got a sullen glow 
glowering face on, and she says, yeah. It means breeder of pigs. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> hey, you know, I suspect that that was sort of how Apollos may have felt about his name. So Baal said, well, you know, um, we're all sinful, and the pig is a picture of the sinful nature, and Christ changes our sinful character to be like him. And he said, well, I hope that would stick. <laughs> People, names have meaning. How many Christian girls do you know named Diana or Diane? We have some, don't we? From the goddess Diana. Names have meanings but you can take the meaning and find some positive character quality that will reflect Christ. Don't give names that don't bring glory to God. Jesus has a name above every name. That the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The name Jesus, Yeshua, means Jehovah is salvation. Jehovah is salvation. That's the name of Jesus. Names relate to character in the Bible. A name does not necessarily determine character, but a name should reflect character. Too many parents choose first names because they're pretty names or they're culturally popular or they once had a boyfriend or a girlfriend by that name and they're naming their kid after an old boyfriend or girlfriend. I mean, I've known people like this. You think, what does the husband or wife think if the parent gives the name to the child after an old boyfriend or girlfriend? I mean, that's bizarre. Anyway, you know something? I'm very thankful that in heaven we're going to be given new names that bring glory to God. The book of Revelation gives many illustrations of names that represent character. Let me just give you a few of those passages. Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Think of all the Indian Christians who were raised in Hindu homes and who got the names of Hindu gods. They're going to get a new name in heaven. Think of all the Buddhist children who were raised in Buddhist homes who got Buddhist names or Confucius names or those who were raised in animistic societies and named after pagan gods. Down the street here is a gas station where I buy my gas, and there are some Indian fellows that work there, and I've had the privilege of sharing Christ with them, I think with every one of the ones who are there. They sort of rotate in and out. And one of the guys had a tattoo on his arm, and so I asked him about it one day. I asked him, what's that tattoo? And he just beamed with pride. He said, that's the name of my God. And he pronounced the name of whatever that God was. There are 330 million gods in Hinduism. And so I said, you know, there's a God in heaven who loves you and he sent his son Jesus to die for you. People use opportunities to share Christ. He had the name of his God tattooed on his arm. Names have meanings. But someday we'll have a stone with a new name written which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Chapter 3, verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down from heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Three new names are mentioned in that verse that God will write on us, showing that we belong to him. God thinks that names are important. Let me just read you a few others. Here are names that describe character. Chapter 6, verse 8. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, 
And hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. There's a name that expresses character. Chapter 8, verse 11. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Chapter 9, verse 11. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon. But in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon, that means destroyer. Names express character. When Judy and I gave names to our children, we spent a lot of time in prayer and study of the scriptures so that we could find both a first name and a middle name that together would mean something that we hoped God would develop as the character of that child. So that God might receive the glory when someone asks them, what does your name mean? I've never heard that name before. They could say, my name means such and such. Let me tell you why my parents gave me that name. They wanted to see the character of Christ developed in me as expressed by this name. Revelation 13.1. Listen to this. I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. The name of Jesus means Jehovah's salvation. The name of this beast rising up out of the sea with the seven heads and the ten horns, the name upon the heads of that beast is the name of blasphemy. A name that requires you to have it, otherwise you can neither buy nor sell. Revelation 13, 17, that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Chapter 14, verse 1, I looked, and lo, a lamb stood in the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Names are important to God. Verse 11, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. It indicates ownership. It indicates character. It indicates the one whom you worship and the authority under which you stand. Chapter 17, verse 5, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, Mother of Harlots, and Abominations of the Earth. That's a character description. Chapter 22, 4, For the believer, And they shall see his face, And his name shall be in their foreheads. Now, I've spent some time on this tonight because that is very striking that God included that information here in the book of Acts in chapter 18, verse 24. A Jew named Apollos. Now, the second phrase here in verse 24 is also somewhat startling when you know church history. God added this information. He didn't have to. It wasn't from what we would consider necessary to know any more about Apollos. But it says, a Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria. Do you know anything about the history of Alexandria? Do you know what Alexandria was the center of and the source of and the problems that it caused in the early church? Alexandria. Alexandria was the center of a Gnostic cult that grew up in the church in the early centuries of the church. You know there's a war going on between different Bible texts today. The Dean Bergen Society meets next month. We support the traditional text. What's called the received text. Did you know there are some other kinds of texts out there that are not the same? They are Gnostic in origin. They have over 8,000 differences. Most of the modern translations have over 8,000 textual differences from the received text upon which the King James is based. Alexandria was the mother city of that. In fact, that group of text types are called the Alexandrian text type because Alexandria was the academic center of that defective text. 
Now, we've discussed some of that in the past. But suffice it to say, if you said he was from Alexandria, that's sort of like saying, oh, yeah, he's from Las Vegas. You know, when you say, oh, this is Joe, he's from Las Vegas. What kind of images pop into your head? What do you think about Las Vegas? You think about the flashing lights. You think about the prostitutes. You think about the gambling. You think about all the wickedness. You think of Las Vegas, Sin City. Oh, you're from Las Vegas. Immediately you begin to, to wonder about and question the character of the person who's there. So Apollo starts off with two strikes against him. He's got a name that glorifies a pagan god. He comes from a city that's rife with Gnosticism. From a city where all kinds of unbelief kind of stuff was moving around in cultic circles. Oh yeah, you're from Las Vegas. You know, it's rather interesting. That's very, very instructive because it shows us that just because a man or a woman was born in or grew up in a place with a bad reputation does not necessarily mean that he or she is bad. You know, we all have prejudices, don't we? Even Jesus experienced that prejudice from one who had become an ardent follower. Jesus clearly grew up in Nazareth. There's no question both Joseph and Mary were from Nazareth. I'll just read you a few verses. Matthew 2, 23, he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Now remember, Nazarene is not the same as a Nazarite. A Nazarene is somebody who is from Nazareth. A Nazarite is somebody who took one of those vows out of Numbers chapter 6. Where was Mary when the angel spoke to her? Uh, Luke 1, 26, in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Nazareth was Mary's hometown. It wasn't just Jesus grew up there. Hey, Mary was from Nazareth. How about chapter 2, verse 4? And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. But Nazareth was Joseph's hometown. We find after Jesus is born, and probably some of his brothers and sisters too, they've been off to Jerusalem to celebrate the feasts. And it says, and when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. Chapter 2, verse 51. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. Chapter 4, verse 16. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Jesus was from Nazareth. Both his parents were from Nazareth. Now listen to what we read over in John chapter 1, verses 45 and 46. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Jesus had the stigma of, as we might say today, being born and raised in Las Vegas. Nazareth. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Here we've got Apollos. He's a guy who has a pagan Greek god name, and yet he's going into synagogues with the name Apollos. And he's arguing with them about the Messiah with that name, and he comes from Alexandria? You know, you've got to have something if you start off with a background like that and everybody knows about it. Did you know that even in his death, the hometown of Jesus was still part of his reputation? John chapter 19, verse 19. Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. But you know, by the time we get to the book of Acts, it's no longer a shame to be identified with Nazareth. Your character can change the reputation of a place. You can make a difference. When you think of New York City and you think of Harlem, what do you think of? Gangs and criminal activity and drugs and rape and slums and people lying around on the sidewalk all day long, totally drunk. But you can make a difference 
in where you live. When you think of Camden, what do you think of? Oh, he's from Camden, or he's from Harlem, or he's from whatever ghetto you want to mention. But you know the righteous character of one person from that place who is not ashamed to be identified with that place. Remember, Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Jesus came into a world that was filled with filth and slime and rot and corruption. And he made a difference. Are we doing it? Look what we read when we get to the book of Acts. We find that the apostles use that phrase over and over and over again. I'm only giving you a few references. Acts chapter 2, verse 22, day of Pentecost. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God. So and so of Las Vegas, a man or a woman approved of God. So and so of Harlem, a man or woman approved of God. So and so of Camden, a man or woman approved of God. So and so of Newark, back in the days of the riots and the burnings, a man or woman approved of God. Among, approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as you yourselves also know. Chapter 3, verse 6, Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. Chapter 4, verse 10, Be it known unto you all that all the people of Israel by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you whole. Chapter 6, verse 14, For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place. That's how he was known. When the disciples spoke to him directly, they always called him Lord every time. When they were talking about him, they talked about him as Jesus of Nazareth. It was no longer a stigma, a mark of shame, because of the character of the man. Doesn't matter where you're from, doesn't matter what your historical background, doesn't matter what your parentage, it matters whether or not you're living for Christ and making a difference. Acts chapter 10, verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Can that be said of you? You're going about doing good, fulfilling the gifts that God has entrusted to you. Did you know that the resurrected Christ referred to himself by the place where he grew up? The resurrected Christ referred to himself by the place where he grew up. Acts ch chapter 22, verse 8. Paul is here quoting what Jesus said to him in chapter 9 on the road to Damascus. As he gives his testimony, he says, And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. The resurrected Christ was talking to Paul, and he referred to himself as Jesus of Nazareth. So Paul continues to refer to him in that same way. Chapter 26, verse 9. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Almost the end of the book of Acts by that point. That's chapter 26. There are only 28 chapters in the book of Acts. And so we have Apollos, a man who was an eloquent man a man who was mighty in the scriptures and came to Ephesus. Those words emphasize some very important things for us. Number one, it says he was mighty in the scriptures and he was eloquent. He had natural gifts. He had spiritual gifts. And we've talked a great deal about all the different spiritual gifts. 21 different spiritual gifts that are listed in the New Testament. Seven of those were temporary gifts. The remainder of those gifts are still available today. What gifts do you have? Are you using them for Christ? Now, you don't have the gifts of apostle or prophet or healings or miracles or tongues or interpretation of tongues or discerning of spirits. Those are the seven temporary gifts. But all the rest of the gifts are still available for you today. Some of them are every believer gifts, like the gift of giving. That's an every believer gift. 
The gift of faith, that's an every believer gift. But you have gifts like the gift of helps, the gift of exhortation. There are multiple gifts that God has given to the body of Christ so that the body of Christ will have a full contingency of gifts so that we might minister to one another and so that our testimony will be the most effective possible testimony in the unbelieving world around us. Do you know what your gifts are? Now, if you're a woman, you don't have the gift of pastor-teacher. You don't have the gift of evangelist. Those are male gifts. There are some gifts that are restricted gifts. But you have some of the other gifts. Do you even know what the gifts are? Do you know which gifts you have? We spent weeks talking about each special spiritual gift and every place it shows up in the New Testament. Do you know what they are? Do you remember? Do you know what your gifts are? Or do you just sort of muddle through life hoping that you're somehow serving Christ? Spiritual gifts. He had divine direction. It says he came to Ephesus. That was no accident, folks. It wasn't he was just sort of wandering around and he decided, well, I guess I'll, uh, I'll come up from Alexandria and I guess I'll go to Ephesus. Hey, I'm on vacation. I mean, there's no better place to go than Ephesus. Why not go to Ephesus? <laughs> God takes his children who are doing his will, who are walking as far as they can with the knowledge that they have, and God leads them to the place where they can get greater knowledge so that they can be more effective for Christ. He came to Ephesus. There's divine direction in that. There are divine appointments in that. He went to a specific synagogue and he ran into a specific couple, Aquila and Priscilla. We talked about the divine intersections in our lives when we were in Acts chapter 8, looking at the Ethiopian eunuch, and how God took Philip from the midst of a tremendous revival that was going on up in Samaria, and God said, I want you to start heading south. He didn't tell him exactly where to go, he just said head south. But God had a man who, at that time, a, a, a black man, an Ethiopian eunuch, neither male nor female, but he had converted to Judaism and he'd gone up to Jerusalem to worship. And he was in a chariot, so he's moving a lot faster than Philip. And he gets to Jerusalem, he does his worship, he turns around, he's coming back, he's on his way back to Ethiopia. And God had worked out the precise intersection of his life and Philip's life. And God worked out precisely what he was doing at the moment that he ran into Philip. He was reading the book of Isaiah, where it talks about the Messiah being led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. And at the very moment that that intersection takes place, the Holy Spirit says to Philip, join yourself to this chariot. That guy would not have been traveling alone. He had been traveling with an armed guard. He was the treasurer of the entire country of Ethiopia. But God got him through the guard and got him too the chariot, and he heard those words, not being read silently, read out loud. Do you know who this is talking about? No, can you tell me? Here, come up in the chariot, I'll give you a ride. Picked up a hitchhiker, out of the blue. Royalty. Some guy walking along the road. But you're interested in the Bible, and so, and so come on, get in my car. Let's talk. And Philip led him to Christ. Did you know there are divine intersections in your life? Where God brings specific people into your life at specific times for a specific purpose and for his glory. And after the Ethiopian eunuch is baptized, the Holy Spirit says, okay, Philip, your job is done here. He takes him up to Azotus. The Ethiopian eunuch looks around and says, man, where did the guy go? But he goes on his way rejoicing, carries it back to Ethiopia. That started a tremendous chain of events in Ethiopia. Wish we had time to talk all about that. Divine intersections. What are you doing with them? We have a divine intersection here. It came to Ephesus. Where I wanted to spend most of my time, and I can't believe my time is almost up. Most of, we may do this again next week. We'll finish this message. Um, he said he was mighty in the scriptures. Folks, that's where the power is. 
It's the word of God that's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's not your arguments that are powerful. It's not your testimony that's powerful, although it's illustrative of what God has done. It's the word of God which is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's the word of God that pierces the heart. It's the word of God that distinguishes right from wrong. He was mighty in the scriptures. What he had, what he knew. Mighty in the scriptures begins with the point of salvation. Paul writes that to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. The scriptures. That's what we have to know. We can know all kinds of other things, and it's totally worthless if we do not know the Bible. Why is the Bible so important? Proverbs 30, verse 5, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. If you want purity, if you want holiness, if you want to know what pleases God, where do you have to go? To a psychologist? No. To a psychiatrist? No. To an ethicist? No. You have to go to the Bible! Every word of God is pure. How do you answer the devil when he tempts you? Look what Jesus did. Luke chapter 4, verse 4. Jesus answered him saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. On each one of the devil's temptations, Jesus quoted the book of Deuteronomy. Now, if Jesus had made something up, it would have been scripture because Jesus is God. But you and I can't make it up as we go along. When we answer the devil, we can't just say, well, I got this neat idea and I think it'll, uh, it'll defeat the devil. No, no. Jesus quoted the Old Testament because that's where the power is. That's the power that defeats Satan. It is written. It's the written word of God. It's not some special revelation that you're going to get. It is written. It's already down in the Bible. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God, not by, by the general concepts, precepts, and principles that you find somewhere in Scripture, if you sort of amalgamate it all together. No, 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 that's not what he said. Every word of God. Inspiration goes down to the very words of Scripture. In fact, Jesus made it clear that inspiration goes down to the very letters of Scripture and to the very parts of the scripture, of the letters, not a jot or a tittle. That's a yod and a little foot that sticks off the side of a letter that changes the letter shall depart from the law until all be fulfilled. We find Jesus basing his deity on the tense of a verb. Before Abraham was, I am. And they took up stones to stone him. And people, you have it. You have a Bible. You have the Word of God. Are you mighty in the Scriptures? Do you love it? Do you cherish it? Would you give your life for it? We learned much here. We've hardly even started scratching the surface of this passage. Let me just give you a couple others and then I'll stop. Jesus used the Scriptures in his parables. Perhaps his most famous parable is the parable of the sower. And he tells us in Luke chapter 8, verse 11, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. If you plant rocks, you get nothing. If you plant banana peels, you get nothing. If you plant nickels, you get nothing. What you have to have is seed if you want to see life and reproduction. Jesus tells us in the parable of the sower, if you want to get anything, you have to plant the word of God. You plant it in your own heart, it brings forth fruit in your heart. John chapter 15. That you'd bear fruit, that you'd bear more fruit, that you'd bear much fruit, that you'd bear abiding fruit, the four levels of fruit bearing in John chapter 15. But there's got to be the Word of God. How can you bear fruit without it? 
How can you lead someone else to Christ without the word of God? Apollos was a man mighty in the scriptures. That's why he was able to refute the Jews who wanted to deny that Jesus was the Christ. Do you know how to use the word of God as a sword in battle? For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You're doing battle. You have armor, but you've only got one offensive weapon. The only weapon you have for defeating the foe is the word of God. They overcome him by the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. The word of God. Mighty in the scriptures. Well, there are many more paths. I mean, I've got a lot more here, but time is up. <laughs> you have to come back next week if you want to hear more about that. All right, so let's go ahead and close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us illustrations out of the life of a man named Apollos, a man who had a strange name for a Jewish baby to be given, named after a Greek god, a Greek god who is a counterfeit of Christ. But in spite of the bad name, in spite of the bad place that he grew up, he was a man who had character, and it changed the lives of those with whom he came in contact because he was not ashamed to preach the truth. And after he understood who Jesus was, he was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Father, make us men and women who are mighty in the scriptures, unashamed of the testimony of Jesus Christ, those who are faithful to the word of God, not to our own ideas, not to psychological manipulation, not to the feel-good theology of so many that are floating around out there today. Make us faithful to the scriptures. Oh, Father, how we thank you that our Lord Jesus Christ is the living word of God and that the written word all points to him. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn for tonight is hymn number 347, And Can It Be That I Should Gain an Interest in the Savior's Blood? We'll